This is the most dangerous situation we have yet to face. Here and now, dangling by the end of a rope, are we awaiting some news from our brethren. I appreciate you joining me here. I know that in different circumstances, we would have done so back in our favorite city, my home, Williamsburg, Virginia. And yet, here we are, inside of my rented home here in Philadelphia. Today, the 13th of May, 1776, as you well know, independence is more or less a foregone conclusion. It will happen. But the next steps are crucial. And they remind me of my family motto. The with family motto, secundus dubiisque rectus. Upright in peril and prosperity. And indeed, with one misstep, we might tumble ourselves into peril. Or, with the right step, we may very well ensure our prosperity. We await here in Philadelphia news from the Virginia Convention. It is indeed right that Virginia should be at the head of the motions for independence. And we are told that it will occur coming from the conventions held in Williamsburg. But we've no means of knowing exactly what's happening there, here and now in these moments. What I can say for you certainly is that until we hear from them, the other delegates from the other colonies can make no motion. I know there are several who have been given the authority by their, uh, by their constituents that they can vote for independence, but only if it is proposed. And so, we wait. We wait with an entire fleet of British ships in New York Harbor. We wait with our major cities infiltrated and infested with Tory-minded people. We wait in this peril. In situations like this, I think oftentimes our minds are turned to the great heroes of the ancient age. We turn our thoughts to uh, the ancient Greeks, for example, and their stance against the Persians, against Darius, and against Xerxes. Our minds are turned to the heroes of the Peloponnese. Our minds are turned to Themistocles. They are turned to perhaps even one more commonly known, Leonidas. Leonidas, who stood at the hot gates, Thermopylae. And at that place, with his famed 300 Spartan men, they made a final stand. But it is important for us to remember in this particular moment that Leonidas, much like General Washington, is not alone. That indeed he was gathered there with 300 of, the, of his Spartan fellows and 7,000 other Greeks. And in that, we find an important lesson. You see, the Greeks knew against such a mighty foe, against a mighty empire, if that found, sounds familiar to you at all, we could not stand an individuality. The individual uh, city-states, these polises, uh, be it Athens or Sparta or Thebes or what have you, could not possibly stand on their own against the invasion of the Persians. It was necessary at that time for them to unite under one banner. They did so against the mighty city of Troy and their allies as well, were successful in that endeavor. And though they failed at Thermopylae, eventually were successful in the war. And this was made possible, a lesson that we ought well learn here in this moment, because they were united. 
here in the Congress at present. I am sorry to say that the vote for independence is entirely split, seven to six. And the detractors, they make note of that fleet up in New York that I myself mentioned a moment ago, and I fully acknowledge. But it is only a matter of time, my dear friends. And so those who might still be quivering at the notion of declaring independence against Great Britain, the time has come for us to find common ground, put those fears aside, and present a united front. I expect that my brethren in Virginia will do the same. And when that is presented here in Philadelphia, I expect that we, 13 united colonies, will all with one voice declare ourselves to be independent. It is through this union, it is through this unanimity that we will ensure prosperity and not peril. We began the war last year with the intention that we should be restored our natural rights as British subjects. Many of us counting to one another the famous line of Horace, Caelum non animum mutant qui trans mare curunt. Those who cross the ocean, they do not change their souls, only change the sky. We will maintain our rights and we will do so by declaring independence. In this, I am certain, but we can only see success if we do so in a united front. I appreciate you joining me here this afternoon. I know that many of you have questions concerning our current situation about how unanimity might be guaranteed for us here in Philadelphia or perhaps even in Virginia. I am happy to share with you whatever I can to reassure you that this is the right step. I'm joined here this afternoon by several of my fellows, uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith, and Mr. Kristoff, who are aiding me in reaching you here. And Mr. Jones, it's my understanding that there are several uh, people who are asking questions and uh, are have inquiries uh, to the matter at hand. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Wythe, absolutely. And again, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with us. I know, I know things are uncertain right now, so we really appreciate your time. And everyone who's watching right now, please, uh, if you have any questions for Mr. Wythe, write them in the comment section, and we would try to answer as many questions as possible while we are all together. Now, uh, Mr. With, we were curious, is there anything at all that may stand in the way of a unified motion for independence in Congress? This is an important question for us to consider here and now, Mr. Jones. And I confess to you that there are many things that stand in the way of a unified front. First of all, uh, as you well know, these 13 colonies have long considered themselves to be quite different from another in almost every respect, save for our common ancestry and for the most part common language. It has been uh, known for a long time that Virginians and Pennsylvanians, for example, cannot even agree on a common border. In addition to that, the aforementioned naval fleet, British naval fleet that finds itself currently within the, border, or in, within the harbor of New York, holding that most valuable place. And indeed, those who are representing New York at the Congress, as you might well understand, are timid on the motions of independence for the sake of their countrymen. Indeed, a myriad of other matters that might come to light and are commonly divided between, say, north and south, or east and west, rustic and well-civilized parts of our individual 13 colonies, city dwellers, country dwellers, etc. And so I should say to you that these are the moments that we must set petty differences aside and acknowledge together that in order to be maintained or rather restored to our natural rights, 
These same rights for the past decade and a half that we have made attempts after attempts, olive branch after olive branch, extended to Parliament and to George III, damn his name. Those have failed. And the only way that we may see them rightfully restored to us is by a new era. And that era, again, will be by the way of unification. And so, Mr. With, you're speaking about this new era and the need for us, uh, these colonies, to come together. Why do you think it's taken so long for the colonies to reach the point where they can declare independence? Mr. Jones, this is uh, one of the most important points to be made. This is not something that has come easily, has it, my friends? I think that we here in, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, you at home, and even when I were back in Williamsburg for so long, had no intentions whatsoever of declaring ourselves to be independent of the crown of Great Britain. And it has indeed taken a long time. It's taken over a decade of abuses and usurpations on behalf of the Parliament and the King of Great Britain before we move towards independence. And this is based very simply in a common notion. A very common uh, philosopher by the name of John Locke, I'm certain you've heard his name before, has said, uh, has written that No government will be able to subsist if people set up a new government every time they take offense at the old. We take in the historic lessons of the last century where new governments were instituted in Britain with the execution of Charles I, the institution of Cromwell, and then the institution again of Charles II, leading to chaos for years by way of the English Civil War. It is not our intention to enter into anarchy But rather, it was never our intention that we should enter into anarchy, but rather that we should be, again, be restored to these natural rights, our natural place, our birthright as full English subjects. But what are our natural rights? Locke would say we have the natural rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit and acquisition of property. Famed jurist, British jurist, mind you, William Blackstone says that the natural rights of a British subject are personal liberty, personal security, and personal property. These sound very similar, do they not? These natural rights have been commonly invaded by Parliament and the King over the course of the past decade and a half. And yet we have withstood it. We have withstood assaults upon our property, outright removal of our property, We have withstood assaults upon our liberty. And it were not until last year, I think, when we saw that the king and that his troops were willing to fire upon and remove even that most basic right of life, that it was determined for many we could not possibly continue to exist under this governance without falling subject to an absolute tyranny. Mm. Mr. Jones. Yes. yes, thank you for that, Mr. With. Now, I know you're speaking about the idea of what are our natural rights. Um, Susie has a curiosity for you. Uh, Susie is wondering, what exactly is your stance currently on slavery, especially with the possibility, uh, we don't know how things are going to play out for the next few weeks or months, let alone, but she wants to know, what is your stance on slavery with the potential for war uh, occurring amongst uh, these 13 colonies with the mother country of England. Susie, I thank you for your question. I can tell that you are an astute person because the rhetoric of our current war is set in tone of freedom and liberty to men. And yet here uh, in Philadelphia, in Rhode Island, in South Carolina, Virginia, and all 13 colonies, slavery is legal. My personal view on the matter, I confess to you, is uncommon to my kindred in Virginia, 
that's even rather uncommon to many here in Philadelphia. At one point in my life, I confessed to you that I was indifferent to it. I'm somewhat embarrassed to say it now. Back a decade ago, I had a friend who lived in the governor's house in Williamsburg. His name was Francis Fauquier. He was the lieutenant governor of Virginia. And we would hold little societies in his house. Myself, my apprentice in the law at the time, a man by the name of Thomas Jefferson, uh, a professor from the college by the name of William Small, Dr. Small, and of course, Governor Fauquier himself. Uh, and in this party quare, as Mr. Jefferson would refer to it, this party of four, we discussed many topics as, you, as gentlemen do in societies. And one of the topics we would discuss is this particular topic, the institution of the keeping of Negroes as chattel property, also referred to commonly as slavery. In this society, this man whom I held the highest regard for, this being uh, Francis Fauquier, the most able man, I will say very plainly to you, to have ever held the office of governor in Virginia, revealed to me that he did not know if he could get into heaven if he held human property. And I confess to you, it affected me greatly. And over the years, I have come to the understanding within my own mind uh, that this institution of slavery, so far as Virginia is concerned, is a blemish a mark, a black mark upon her reputation, and it will continue to be so, so long as it exists. However, this is a matter that I am convinced will not be settled in these moments. In these moments, the question of whether or not uh, we, these United States will in fact be, excuse me, these United Colonies will become United States is a question of whether or not they can unite at all. And I am certain in this moment, if I might be so bold, Susie, as to tell you that South Carolina, Georgia, and Rhode Island in particular, I am sure, will not unite under a banner of ending the institution. Carolina and Georgia for the agricultural purposes of it, and Rhode Island for the purposes of importation and selling. Mr. Jones. Thank you for that response, Mr. Wiff. Um, now, we know there probably has to have, uh, there probably needs to be a lot of conversations that happen amongst you and uh, your fellow members of Congress. And Tina and Denise, both have curiosities about, uh, Tina says, how can you convince men whose lives and their livelihoods depend on trade with Britain to vote separate from their main trading entity? And along with that, Denise is curious, uh, do you have specific plans of action to have uh, your fellow representatives, um, you know, to garner their support uh, to really move forward with the call for arms and war. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Tina and Denise. I greatly appreciate uh, your inquiry, and it's a very important and perhaps uh, you might consider it uh, a primary necessary, a primarily necessary inquiry. The very plain truth is, as I have told you, we have existed for these past, this past century or more, depending on the colony, as individual places that hardly could agree again on things so, so simple as a common border. How is it that we can expect these men, myself included, who have depended upon Great Britain for trade, to vote in favor of breaking those bonds? Well, in truth, I will confess to you, this will not be a breaking of bonds with trade in Great Britain, but rather it will be an expansion of trade. You see, by law, we have been trading with Great Britain over the course of the past 150 years here in Virginia. But the truth of the matter is, is that when that trade, those goods are removed from Virginia and sent to Britain, they are then sent out across the world. I would encourage you to think of perhaps even the most prominent, or at least one time, at one time, the most prominent crop of Virginia, tobacco. The sweet-scented tobacco, the good smoking tobacco, which was grown in the tidewater, 
sent across the ocean and commonly smoked up in Britain, whereas the Orinoco, or as uh, the, uh, the uh, stinking weed, as James I referred to it, was finally ground into snuff, which was then sent out to the rest of Europe, to the continent, and taken up their nose. You see, it's not that the trade bonds that exist between America and Britain are the only bonds that can exist. As a matter of fact, we are keenly, keenly aware that the rest of the world is quite interested in our land, our timber, and other natural resources that come from here in, uh, in Pennsylvania, from home in Virginia, and indeed from the rest of North America. Last year, in 75, there was a delegate from the colony of Georgia by the name of Zubli, John Zubli. Perhaps you know him. If you don't, I think you're probably better for it. He stood upon the floor, and he asked this question more directly. He said, what of our friends in Britain? Will we not disaffect them by intending towards independence? And I'll tell you what I told him. I stood and spoke to the floor saying, our friends in Britain already know by king and parliament that we intend for independence. They will surely not be disaffected by any motion that we might make in that direction. Mr. Zubli stood again. And he said, well, what of the others? What of Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, etc.? And I stood and I responded to him. I said, I cannot speak for Pennsylvania. I cannot speak for Massachusetts. I cannot speak for the others, but for Virginia, I can. And wouldn't you know, the man was so horribly offended that he quit the Congress shortly thereafter. Mr. Zubli returned to Savannah, which I understand has been a hotbed of Tory activity, a veritable Zubli zoo. Now, as to the future of these bonds, I can say to you very plainly that it is of no man's interest that we should break from Britain in its entirety to end, uh, politically speaking, yes, but commercially speaking, certainly not. We must hold them as we hold the rest of mankind in enemies, or excuse me, in war, enemies, but in peace. Friends. Thank you. Now, sir, we have some questions about your home uh, mm. in Virginia. Now, uh, the My first. Home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, the uh, first curiosity is well, what is Williamsburg's role in deciding to motion towards independence in Philadelphia? Thank you, Mr. Jones. My I haven't seen my home in almost a year, but I can tell you very plainly that Virginia's role, Williamsburg specifically, in our current crisis, in our current situation, is quite heavy. You see, last year in April, when men at Lexington and Concord up in Massachusetts stood upon the green to defend their powder against British troops that were marching on to remove that public powder. They did so because their minds had been changed. And I can tell you very plainly that Virginia, for the most part, Williamsburg specifically, has been spared from the fighting in the war in which we are currently embroiled, but a different battle has been raging for some time. That is a battle of the mind. My friends, those men who very unfortunately lost their lives as the result of the tyrannical actions of the British army at Lexington and Concord last year are not standing on that field unless they had had their minds changed about their position, about their rights, and about their role in defending those rights. And that mindset changed, in my opinion, in Williamsburg, in places like the Raleigh Tavern, 
in places such as Vobes Tavern, the King's Arms. Uh, to go back further, the time of the stamp crisis, many conversations being held at Charlton's Coffee House. But not only those places where men gather either, women's minds were changed as well, were they not? Perhaps not in taverns, or at least not commonly, but in parlors, around dinner tables. No idea has ever passed around a committee table in government before it was passed around a dinner table at home. Of that, I am certain. And so very plainly, I say to you this. The influence of Williamsburg in Philadelphia, where I sit right now, is so immense that in my opinion, if the actions of men in taverns and parlors and dinner, around dinner tables had not occurred in Williamsburg, I would not be at the Congress even just now. Now, Mr. Whiff, speaking of influence, would you say uh, your political uh, mindset uh, influences your families, or do you uh, find that some of your family members might have some opposing viewpoints about uh, your specific call to action right now. You're speaking of Mrs. With, are you, Mr. <laughs> Jones? <laughs> Indeed I was, <laughs> sir. <laughs> I have been very fortunate in to have a wife who is not only of good counsel but is of sound mind and has provided me with the best companionship that I could possibly ask. I know many men who would say the same. And indeed, what is a man's wife, Mr. Mr. Jones, what is a man's partner in this life except exactly that, their partner in this life, one with whom they ought to take counsel and whose advice they ought to take seriously? I meant it a moment ago when I said that no idea that has ever passed around a committee table in government has uh, done so before it was passed around a dinner table at home. It is necessary and wise that a man should listen to his household, be it his wife or even his children and their opinions, at the very least so that his children can understand that their opinions are valid. Now it is his decision, at least in Virginia and throughout these colonies at present, that the husband, the man of the house, is the one who has the public face and the one who expresses that by way of the franchise, that is to vote. But it does not mean that a man uh, simply acts unilaterally. It stands against reason. It stands against scripture. And in my opinion, it stands against good sense. And sir, Elizabeth was inquiring, uh, did Mrs. With or has she accompanied you up to Philadelphia? Is she here right now? She is, Mr. Jones. Elizabeth, thank you for asking. You have the same name as Mrs. With, by the by. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, you wouldn't happen to be a Tolliver, would you? <laughs> That's uh, Mrs. With's uh, family name, Tolliver, spelled Taliaferro. As I understand it, when, uh, when her family came here, it was rather unpopular uh, in Virginia. Uh, to be uh, Italian, and so they kept the spelling of the name, but they, uh, they uh, Englishified, if you will, the pronunciation, uh, only perpetuating the great English tradition, isn't it, of not pronouncing words the way that they're spelled. <laughs> Mrs. With uh, has been here and enjoyed good health, but she very much as I in our conversations, I can tell it, though she understands the importance of our work here, misses our home. Not only Williamsburg, but specifically our home along the Palace Street. I, uh, I can't help but think, Elizabeth, that at some point we will return uh, to that home, and I think we'll both be very glad of it. Well, Mr. Wythe, uh, I have a few more questions for you, and I know that you certainly have some business that you have to uh, tend to oh, shortly, so I just want to ask you a few things. Um, one, uh, Bridgette was curious about your education. Could mm -hmm. you just tell us where you were educated and um, 
a little bit about your experience. Bridget, I thank you for asking. You uh, perhaps are aware that I have taken a number of apprentices in the law in my home uh, as their master with the expectation that they should learn the arts and mysteries of the law uh, and practice it uh, at the conclusion of said apprenticeship. I, by way of education, uh, have enjoyed good education throughout my life. Uh, when I were young, I attended to the Sims Free School, a school that was adjacent to my family's property at a place called Hampton. Uh, uh, rather, the place is called Chesterville, but it's adjacent to the town of Hampton. And the free school, being directly next to my property, was a convenient place for me to learn uh, the basics of writing and reading in English and also of basic arithmetic the same. At some point in her life, my mother, a remarkable woman, Bridget, her name was Margaret Walker With. At some point in her life, she came to understand the rudiments of the Roman language. And you know, Bridget, I'm the second son in my family. I was not intended to inherit the property, and so the law was chosen for me at a very young age. And it was the determination of my mother that she should teach me what she knew about the Roman language. Now, I did not learn to read Cicero or Cicero by, by my mother's hand, but rather she gave me enough of an advancement that I might be able myself to pursue it further. And so at about the age of 13, when I came to the city of Williamsburg for the first time, I attended for less than a year at the grammar school uh, studying Greek and Roman grammar before I was apprentice. A very common thing for lawyers to be apprenticed. It's not quite the same as a tradesman, but you understand my meaning, I think, that I was taken under the, uh, I was taken under the wing of a practicing lawyer. This particular circumstance happened to be my uncle, a man by the name of Stephen Dewey. And I confess to you, Bridget, under my uncle's guide, I learned very little. I don't wish to defame the man, a good man and a good lawyer, but I was confined for four years to the drudgeries of his office, so much so that when I returned to the East, uh, I was in Petersburg for the, uh, for the apprenticeship. When I returned to the East, I went back to my family's property at Chesterville, and I read two years further under my own guide before I dared approach to have my certificate, my law certificate signed that I might practice the law. But education doesn't stop at the conclusion of an apprenticeship. It never stops. And I'm very happy to say that I have had the opportunity to be a lifelong learner and if anyone has the opportunity to learn new skills or new languages, uh, to read new books, I always encourage them to do so. And I think that's all that I have to say about that, Mr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's quite all right. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, letting us know a bit about your journey, Mr. Wiss. Now, again, we really appreciate your time and just speaking with us. but. Before we go, Mr. Wyss, I, I do have one final question about the current climate and um, the large matter at hand. Mm. And we're all curious. If independence is declared in Congress, mm -hmm. what do you predict for the future of these 13 colonies? The future of these colonies in my opinion, will depend upon perhaps even the next few days, perhaps the next few hours. Today is the 13th of May, and we have a choice to make. Whether we will dive into this particular endeavor that, ap that appears to be inevitable, unified or divided. My family's motto, again, secundus dubiesque rectus, upright in prosperity and peril. And these two points seem to be the choices that we have just now. We may begin divided, continuing to squabble over petty differences, concerned over the difference between the 
the parallels of Virginia and Pennsylvania, meaning the border between us, or we may set those aside and unite as one people. The virtuous choice lies with us all. And here at present, we see very plainly the effects of that choice. A seven to six split in the Congress will not do. The Baron de Montesquieu, in his seminal work, The Spirit of the Laws, says that in an absolute tyranny, only one man must practice virtue. Only one man has power. The tyrant, yes, the king. In an oligarchy or an aristocracy, I believe is the word he uses, where only a few have power, only a few must practice virtue. But here at present, we are electing representatives. This is a democratic republic system that we have established here. These men who are elected to the Congress are the representatives of the freeholders of the various colonies from which they come. Therefore, to finish the quote from Montesquieu, in a democracy, or in our case, a republican democracy, who must practice virtue? You know the answer. We all must practice virtue. And that virtue is here and now, I am convinced, will be found in taking these many varying peoples of these 13 individual colonies and uniting them under one banner for one cause, the restoring of our rights in the declaring of independence from Great Britain. My friends and neighbors, it is impossible for us to conceive a victorious solution otherwise. And so let us unite together and present that front as we await news from Virginia and what I hope is a unanimous decision there. We will continue to push for a unanimous decision here so that all of these varying peoples will again unite under that one banner. E pluribus unum out of us many, unum, one. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this Colonial Williamsburg presentation. We appreciate your time and viewership. Special thanks to our donors for their generous support that make programs like this possible.